first topic of discussion would be basics of occlusion. Occlusion, what is it? It is just a contact relationship of the teeth in function or in parafunction. So you can say when we talk about occlusion, we cannot limit ourselves just to the discussion of teeth. We have to be talking about other functional units that involve the joints and the muscles of the head and neck as well. Primary arch form is oval. So basic arch form is oval and by the age of 9 months, the width of this arch has been established not only for the decidus but also for the permanently. It doesn't sound so true, right? That by 9 months of age, by at such a small age, width of the arch has been fully formed. But yes, most of the change that happens after this 9 months is in the anteroposterior dimension rather than in the width of the jaw. Now when we are talking about the deciduous teeth, the mesolingual cusp of the maxillary molars, they occlude in the central fossa of the deciduous mandibular molars. And because of this, but, but the mandibular deciduous molar, it has more of the mesiodistal diameter, the maxillary second molar. Because of this, what we get is flush terminal plane. We will see it in the diagram here. What we see here is the mesolingual cusp will fit into the central fossa of this, the mandibular. If we imagine this scenario, what we should get is a kind of plus one scenario. But what happens is the dimension of the second mandibular molar, second deciduous mandibular molar is quite a bit more mesiodistal. Because of this reason, what we get is a flush terminal plane. How this flush terminal plane is important, we will be seeing in further slides. Next, we'll be talking about leeway space. What is leeway space? If you notice in this diagram, these, this is your deciduous canine, the deciduous first molar, and this is your deciduous second molar. This deciduous canine is replaced by permanent canine, then the molars, they are replaced by premolars. But if you take the total dimension of deciduous canine and molars, this dimension is more than the total dimension of your canine and premolars, that is the permanent ones. And because of this distance, what we get is an extra space. And this extra space is used for conversion of this flesh terminal plane into the class 1 occlusion. So what is your leeway space? It is the total width of deciduous canine and molars minus the total width of permanent canines and premolars. In maxillary arch, what we get is 1.8. And in mandibular arch, what we get is 3.4 and now we see that it is more in mandibular arch so obviously this permanent mandibular molar will get more chance more space to shift mesially as compared to the permanent maxillary first molar creating a mesial step here other than the leeway spaces we have one more space to discuss that is the primate spaces primate spaces in maxillary teeth they are present mesial. This is your central incisors, and this is where the maxillary spaces. It's mesial to canine, while in mandible it is present distal to the canine. Again, these spaces are used for the mesial shift of the permanent molars. So early mesial shift from end on occlusion to the class one occurs by utilization of primate spaces, and the late mesial shift it occurs by utilization of leeway spaces. Various people have tried to give some shape to the occlusion and Bonneville he was the first to describe the mandible and mandibular arch in an equilateral triangle of 4 inch and he said that mandibular arch it formed an equilateral triangle if you join the point here between the two central incisors to the two condyles and what we get is a 4 inch equilateral triangle although this Bonneville's concept that did not have much of application then we have curve of speed that was anterior posterior curve which is imaginary line touching the buccal cusp of the lower teeth from lower canine backwards. So what we get is all the buccal cusp they approximate to an arc of circle which has a radius of 4 inch or 10 centimeters. And if you continue this arc backwards this will pass through the head of the condyle. We will see this diagrammatically. If you take canine and if you draw, touch the buccal cusps, you will get a curve. And this curve will be an arc of the sphere which has 4 inch or 10 centimeters. 
if you continue this arc if you try to continue this arc it will go through the head of the condyle so this is your curve of spi then we have the curve of monson or the lateral curve what monson did was he tried to confirm all the cusp and incisal edges to a segment of the sphere so this was a three dimensional orientation of the cusp of the teeth so you can see in this diagram what we have here is if you take a sphere if you take a part of the sphere all the teeth will touch this convex surface of the sphere the radius is again 4 inches then we have an anti monson curve this anti monson curve it is a curve of occlusion that involves the teeth which are anterior to the premolars so we had been talking about posterior teeth forming curve of spi now when we see anterior teeth they form a curve which has a convexity facing upwards and this curve was called as anti monson curve in this diagram what we can see is that the maxillary arch is larger as compared to the mandibular arch so if you can see this is the exact dimensions given so we can just notice here if we drop down the shadow of the maxillary arch this maxillary arch is larger because of this reason it is the palatal cusp of the maxillary arch that coincide with the central fossa line so you can see this line this is a this line goes through the palatal cusp and it continues in the central fossa here so when we try to close the maxilla to mandible this cusp will exactly contact this central fossa line while in this side if you see the buccal cusp they fit into the central fossa line of the maxilla here so usually the maxillary arch is larger than the mandibular arch resulting in maxillary cusp overlapping the mandibular cusp when the arches are closed now the cusp that contact the opposite teeth in the central fossa they are called as the supporting cusp so we have already seen that this is the buccal side and this is the lingual side we have seen that the maxillary arch is larger than the mandibular arch because of which the maxillary palatal cusp they fit into the central fossa while the mandibular buccal cusp they fit into the central fossa the cusp that fit along the central fossa are called as the supporting cusp so these are the supporting cusp they are also called as centric cusp holding cusp or stamp cusp while the cusp that overlaps the opposite tooth they are called as the non supporting cusp the non centric cusp or the non holding cusp now if we count the contact points you know the total number of occlusion contact point in the dentition is maxillary intercuspation it is the position of the mandible when most of the teeth they come in contact with each other when most of the teeth they come in contact with each other we get what we get is most of supporting cusps they are fitting in well into the central fossa while the incisors the lower incisors they are touching the lingual inclines of the upper incisors in this diagram we will be talking about the supporting cusp and the non supporting cusp what we can see here is these are the supporting cusp that fit into the central fossa of the opposite tooth in the maxillary teeth the palatal cusp forms the supporting cusp while in the mandibular teeth it's a buccal cusp in the mandibular teeth the lingual incline is called the occlusal slope while in the maxillary teeth palatal cusp the buccal incline is called the occlusal slope number 4 this is the central fossa and number 5 this is the guiding incline wherein the outer surface that is functional outer aspect this point this is the 1 to 2 mm area of the supporting cusp that contacts the opposite teeth that contacts the guiding cusp of the opposite teeth this area is called as the functional occlusal aspect and the area to which it contacts it is called as the guiding incline which is a part of the guiding cusp if we 